Secular humanism has discredited itself. Everyone can now see that all the basic assumptions come from the Bible. You are sawing off the branch on which you are sitting. Hi, I'm Glenn from Speak Life. We like to see all things through the lens of Jesus. We're in a series called The Way Back. Is there a way back to Christian faith in our post-Christian moment? We happen to think so. And another person who happens to think so is Vishal Mangalwadi. I've loved his writing and his speaking uh, for many years. Uh, his book back in 2011, The Book That Made Your World was absolutely paradigm shifting for me and set me on a path that I've been following for the last 12 years. So Vishal, thank you so much for joining us on the channel. Well, thank you. I'm honored. The book that made your world uh, was just eye-opening for me when I read it, I guess, 12 years ago now. And you were writing, um, coming out of a, an Indian background and uh, a philosopher and thinking very deeply about the ways of this world. And you came to a conclusion that absolutely uh, knocked me for six back in 2011. I've been sort of pulling at the threads uh, of your book in 2011 for the last 12 years. It set me on a path to, to write a book in similar territory last year called The Air That We Breathe. So in Tom Holland's book, Dominion, he, he said that uh, Christianization happens in two different ways, uh, either through conversion or through secularization. And, and he uses the example of India in, in, in his book in, in 2019 about how the Christianization of, of India um, largely has happened th through the, the, the establishment of a, of a secular realm and that that is a profoundly Christian idea. That, that might sound a, a strange uh, idea to many. We, we, we tend to think, certainly in the West, we tend to think that the secular is just whatever is not religious. But I think Tom Holland, and, and certainly your book was helpful as well, in, in thinking about the secular is a profoundly Christian idea that you don't find in, in kind of non-Christian religions. Can, can you tease that out for yes. us? Yes, sure. Uh, Tom Holland is uh, accurate, correct in that. Uh, it was an Australian um, professor. Uh, uh, the, 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 his book is called Biblical Origins of Modern Secular Culture, uh, Bruce Glover. His book uh, was a reflection of 40 years of study of Western uh, secular humanism. And he argued that the Bible had produced four religions, not three. Uh, Ju Judaism was first, Christianity was second, Islam was third, and secularism is a fourth religion. Secularism is a biblical heresy. It is uh, like you take beautiful flowers uh, from a field, you cut off their stems and put them in a vase. Uh, so the vase is beautiful flowers and if you're putting water and uh, chemicals, the flowers can stay for a while. So that's what secularism is. It has taken the best of uh, Christian thought and ideas, which grew out of Christian roots and beliefs and worldview, and put them uh, in a vase, and, but of course they dry up. So that's what is happening in Europe, uh, and, uh, North America, Australia, etc., that the flowers are drying up because they have been cut off from their roots. So there is no nurturing, but the question whether there is a way back is that these flowers might dry, wither, uh, as it happened in Germany. Germany was where Protestant Reformation was born. It was the most educated and strongest nation in Europe, and it still is the most strongest nation economically in Europe. Uh, but it became the great villain of the 20th century. In the 21st century, the USA could become the great villain, a terror upon the whole earth, as the flowers have been cut off. It is still a beautiful country, but that's beauty not rooted in anything, uh, because cut off from its roots. But the good news is that when you have cut the stem off a bulb, the bulb is still there in the ground, and it can sprout again. So from the stump, 
of Jesse from the house of David, as Isaiah says, a new branch will sprout, will come out, uh, because there is life uh, in the roots and in the ground. So the seeds have been sown, and those seeds will uh, bear fruit again. So branches and buds and flowers and fruit will come, and healing will come for the nations. So. Uh, uh, th that's partly the objective of uh, my books, that uh, the fruit that uh, the, uh, the flowers that the Bi Bible's truth, the revealed truth had revealed, can once again uh, experience a revival. Uh, you know, I, Ezekiel put it differently, the question that you are uh, answering. Um, Ezekiel, in, in Ezekiel, 33, the temple was destroyed. He himself had been taken as a young man when Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews from Jerusalem captive to Babylon. But uh, the J Jerusalem temple was destroyed in the second invasion. Uh, but uh, uh, destruction of the temple really uh, disillusioned the Jews that there is no hope now. Our nation is gone. We have finished. And God asked Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Is there a way back? And uh, Ezekiel is prudent. He says, you know, all my theological and philosophical fraternity is quite pessimistic. We don't believe that there's hope for a resurrection, but you might have different ideas. And God says, no, you. Son of man, you're a man, but you prophesy, speak to these bones, and the life came. So uh, Israel was indeed resurrected. So um, th that's part of the motivation behind these books and series, not only to see India transformed and reformed, uh, what the Bible began in reforming India, for it to be completed, and for India to become a just and free and great nation, uh, but also to bless the West, because we have been blessed by Western Christianity. Hmm. So I, I love that you're drawing our attention to um, Ezekiel 37, and, and the prophet is told to prophesy to the bones, to speak, to preach, and then by the spirits, what was dead comes to life. And I, I love that emphasis because it, it could be so easy just to think, okay, we have certain principles in the Bible, and if we just apply the, the principles rigorously, then we can build a functioning civilization. And you're saying, no, it's a spiritual reality that is carried by the Spirit of God that is wielded by preachers preaching the Word of God. Um, can, you, can you give us some hope perhaps in historical context, as you look back at the ways in which yes. preaching and the Word of God has, has created a spiritual revival? Within the Old Testament, you see repeatedly when the Word is preached, uh, there is a revival, a reformation, whether during the time of kings, Ezra is a classic example, Nehemiah, is a classic example. They're building the temple, the physical temple, they're building the wall, physical wall, but it is the preaching of the word, teaching of the word, exposition of the word. Now, this was in fact uh, the strategy that Jesus used. Um, he was born in the, at the time of Herod. Herod would have killed him when he was just a baby except that Joseph and Mary took him to Egypt, and he was saved. But John the Baptist is a highly honored public figure. Herod uh, takes his brother's wife to be his mistress, and John objects. Uh, this is not right. Herod has him beheaded. So... An innocent public figure's head is brought before the guests of honor, the mightiest men of the kingdom, um, of, at a dinner feast. 
the objective is obviously to terrorize everyone, that absolute power is with the king, and all his mighty men should fear for their lives. No one is safe except at king's pleasure. So this is slavery, this is oppression. Uh, how is this possible? This is the question that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien are struggling. Both of them fight in uh, World War I. They're writing Narnia and Lord of the Rings, etc. And during World War II. How can the most educated nation in Europe become so evil that millions of innocent people are being tortured and killed? That's the question. Does evil have a supernatural dimension? So the New Testament answers Jesus at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Uh, Satan says that these are my kingdoms. You want kingdom? You want to be a king? Bow before me. Compromise with evil. That's what in George Lucas's Star Wars saga, you have the emperor saying uh, to Anakin, or to others later, that if you want power, join my side, because I have the power. Uh, Jesus refuses. He comes preaching God's kingdom, but Jesus agrees with Satan that the world becomes as evil as it does, because there is a supernatural uh, dimension to evil. But how does the kingdom of God come? Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a sower sowing seeds. What is the seed? Seed is the word of God. The word of God, when it is planted in the hearts and minds of people, it sprouts. Now, bad seed, bad ideas are also sown by the devil, by God's enemy, and both sprout. And tolerance is necessary to allow uh, weed and wheat to grow together. Sinners will persecute saints, murder saints, and this is happening all over the world. Saints must love and serve and seek to save the sinners. Uh, the image of the millennium is when Satan has been bound from deceiving the nations because the saints have done their job of sowing the seed of God's word in the hearts and minds of people, uh, that a visitor looking at the field uh, only sees the wheat. He doesn't actually see the weed, uh, although Satan is not dead, he is still there. Uh, uh, the, the, the picture of millennium in uh, uh, Revelation 20. Uh, but uh, so the strategy is to sow the seed, the word, which transforms. So uh, I'm very grateful that you began this uh, discussion uh, with saying that the seeds that uh, my wife and I uh, spent months uh, trying to understand how modern England, modern Europe, North America was created and its impact on nations such as India or Indonesia or Africa, uh, that those seeds that we put together in that book uh, were bearing fruit, and this, of course, has had uh, significant impact. Uh, the, you know, I'm not a celebrity author, um, but uh, the the book having uh, is being read, and uh, the, you know its most remarkable impact was on Dr. Jordan Peterson when he read it and interviewed me. Uh, about that book, one hour, 47 minutes. Uh, but since then, he has internalized many of the ideas, and many of those ideas are being expressed in several of his podcasts and statements of the impact that the Bible has had in creating the modern world. So he doesn't quote me, he doesn't refer to me, uh, but uh, just as the, uh, the book has had the same kind of a transformative impact. Of course, he was already feeling that way, just as Tom Holland was has been feeling, that the modern world cannot be understood without understanding the power of the Bible and its ideas. So although Tom is more reluctant to say that the Bible is true, um, uh, 
but hopefully he will change. Um, but he's on the right course of seeing that it was in fact the Bible, God's word, which created, which changed history, changed empires, changed cultures, civilization. And that power uh, uh, is to be, um, uh, he has a hard time believing it, um, but he likes the fr flowers and he likes the right. fruit. Right, right. What do you think is the next step with a, with a Jordan Peterson or a Tom Holland, somebody who, who is awake to and alive to, and in both their cases, they, they have taught millions of people the, um, the incredible yes. impact of the scriptures on society. Um, and on some level, I, you know, I, I, I don't have a window into either of their souls to, to know um, what, what in, entirely is going on with them. But what would, what would be the next step? Because I know lots of people in my life who say to me, ah, oh, the Bible has built the modern world. Maybe I should give church a try. And then they, they don't actually end up in church on Sunday. Um, what, what do you think is the next step for somebody who they, they agree with the Vishal Mangalwadi thesis, the book, this book has made our world, now what? Well, it, 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 I see people like them as um, uh, what happened to Mortimer Adler. Adler uh, was considered America's greatest philosoph philosopher in the previous generation. He was born and grew up in a non-observant Jewish family. At the age of 14, he started reading Aristotle, and then he graduated to Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and uh, he was invited to start this great books project in Chicago uh, with the president, uh, Robert Hutchins, uh, partnering with him. Encyclopedia Britannica asked the two of them uh, to create a humanist canon like Hutchins had grown up in a Presbyterian home and rejected Christianity. But having rejected Christianity, they, he realized that we needed a standard, a, a humanist standard. So the, he would call himself a humanist, a humanist standard. And yes, let's look at all the wisdom of the West from before Christ in the Greek Roman era, uh, all the way to their time. And they created, in 1952, they published 54 volumes. Each volume had multiple books. And then later, the, uh, it was extended to 60 volumes. So here is the best of the West in the humanist canon. But that project, commercially, it was phenomena because um, uh, 50, a million sets were sold. Of, of those books. Um, but the, the, within a generation, the project had failed. Uh, and Alan Bloom, in, who was also a Chicago professor, also grew up a Jew, a liberal Jew, practicing homosexual. Uh, in his 1987 book, The Closing of the American Mind, he laments uh, that the Great Book Project has failed. Now, he was very much pro-Great Books, although another British historian, David Gress, um, has been anti-Great uh, Books Project. Uh, but uh, uh, Alan Bloom defended the Great Books, but he lamented that students, teachers, the universities were no longer uh, interested in the Great Books of Western Civilization. And the reason was, one, most of the books cannot be understood because they're rooted in the Bible. You can't understand Milton or Bunyan or Dickens or Jane Austen, etc., if you don't understand the Bible. Uh, and since the public schools are no longer teaching the Bible, the uh, high school graduates, when they come into the university, they have no intellectual background to understand Western music, Western art, uh, Western architecture, constitutions, legal systems, etc., because they don't understand the Bible. The second factor, uh, which, which is very interesting and which is heart of uh, Alan Bloom's argument, that the universities defend th this whole humanist project. Everyone knows that this is not God's word. This is not truth. This is relative truth. There's a lot more contradiction in human wisdom and folly than in the Bible. 
So Bible was rejected because of alleged con- contradictions in the Bible. But when you begin to look at the humanist wisdom, there's much more contradiction in uh, an immorality in the humanist wisdom. So uh, it, this was called openness to all the contradictory ideas. B- with the, what, what that means is that this is openness to relative truth, relative untruth. And the students were saying, first of all, we don't understand these great books and great music great art. But on the other hand, uh, when you are yourself admitting that these are relative untruths, all these humanist writers are blind uh, thinkers guiding the blind, why should we follow them? So the Great Books Project failed. And most interesting thing was Edler, and this is the answer to your question about Tom Holland, Jordan Peterson, etc., that Edler, at the ripe old age of uh, 82, he was born in 1902, in 1984, he converted to Christ. Uh, It was during sickness when he had the time to reflect that here is one man who has uh, dedicated his whole life since the age of 14, to studying and understanding the greatest of uh, he, uh, human thinkers, writers, um, innovators, and has been, is lost. So he turns to God. So now, unfortunately, this was in America. He was in America. Uh, this was the age of Billy Graham and Bill Bright, of mass evangelism. Uh, America did not have uh, Protestant thinkers, evangelical thinkers, uh, philosophers who would walk with him uh, in his long life of quest. Uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 But uh, it is a little different now, both in England and in America. There are people, who, uh, Christians, who are walking with Tom Holland, like you uh, respect him. There are people who are walking with Jordan Peterson and uh, when God's spirit works, uh, how he does, what he does uh, is, uh, we do not know, we cannot plan, but to be friends, to walk with them, uh, understand their struggle, uh, and honestly discuss it. So Tom Holland and I debated whether modern democracy of freedom came from Greece or from the Bible. So our debate is on YouTube. Uh, 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 but I haven't yet become friends with him because uh, he's in England, I'm not there. Uh, but I think there are a number of people like yourself who are uh, his friends. And uh, I have uh, no doubt that the, the Lord is preparing these people and they would be more uh, powerful voices. The, unfortunately, uh, for the second half of the 20th century, evangelism was understood as preaching the gospel and giving an altar call and seeing response, immediate response. This is evangelism. So walking with someone for 50 years through the intellectual struggles and philosophy and seeing that this is the message for the healing of the nations, uh, that concept you know, was not there. But uh, the days are different. Uh, on the one hand, uh, secular humanism has discredited itself. Uh, it has, e- everyone can now see that all the basic assumptions come from the Bible. And, uh, and then you, you are sawing off the branch on which you are sitting. That's what secular intellectuals have been doing. They're sitting on, on a branch that grew out of the biblical roots and they were sawing, sawing off that branch on which they were sitting. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, yes, many of the branches have gone, many of the churches have become ridiculous, but new branches will grow out. Yes. So you, say, you said earlier about Bruce Glover, who said the Bible is created for religions, um, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, yeah. and s- sort of secular humanism, as, as, as it were. Um, <laughs> is there a sense in which there's, a, there's now a kind of a fifth kind of post-Christian religion that's out there in, in terms of 
um, who knows what, there's so many different names for it, woke ideology or, or radical progressivism, that, that sort of yeah. thing. Is, 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 is that another successor to, to the others? Uh, yes, uh, yes. So at one level, the emphasis on same-sex marriage is a rebellion against the Bible's idea that God created Adam and Eve for them to be one flesh. But yet, on the other hand, it is very uh, much rooted in biblical culture in that uh, if I'm bisexual, sometimes I'm attracted to a man, sometimes I'm attracted to a female. Why can't I have two spouses, a male and a female, three of us living together? And if I'm attracted to more than one man, why can't I have polygamy, uh, both male and female, a harem, as many of the kings used to have, including in India, uh, that they have male servants and female slaves, and you have a big harem. So uh, why uh, the idea that uh, one person should have only one living spouse, a uh, legal spouse at a time, uh, this is still coming out of a Christian a milieu uh, that, yes, I'm rebelling against God, that I do not want to marry our opposite sex, uh, but I'm yet submitting to God's idea that there was only one Eve for one Adam. Uh, he didn't create four Eves or 70 Eves in the paradise for an Adam. So th at fundamental level, the whole fight uh, in Vogue culture on the human equality the concept of equality that black lives matter is correct because all lives matter uh, but uh, wha what actually makes uh, one man equal to another if we have all evolved did we all evolve equal evolution is a theory to explain inequality it presupposes inequality that no one is equal, no species, no uh, social group. Uh, there is social evolution, there is biological evolution. Uh, evolution is that some are inferior to others. So on the basis of evolution, you cannot build or affirm a case for human equality. The human equality which is very essential, the, and the concept of freedom, which is and justice, which are uh, undergirding uh, this fifth religion, as you described, the woke, woke religion, uh, it is building upon Christian culture uh, for freedom, justice, equality, human dignity. These are all biblical ideas. Yeah, yeah. And, and yet divorced from the Bible's narrative, they wear the clothing of Christian instincts and values, such as diversity, inclusion, and equity, and all these sorts of things. And yet what's remained to us has been the, the passionate beliefs in such values, and the substance has been changed quite radically, such that a post-Christian world is surprisingly moralistic, actually. I, I think probably, you know, probably 60, 70 years ago, they, they would have predicted that a post-Christian society would be amoral. Um, Mm -hmm. I, want, I wonder if it's taken us by surprise how very moral, in one sense, how very moralistic a post-Christian society has become. And, and my, my reflections on that is that if you take the Bible's values, but you don't take the Savior himself, um, then I guess values cannot forgive you. Only, only Christ can forgive you. Uh, that, yeah. that is absolutely true, uh, because... Uh, you taking one aspect of biblical truth, let's say human dignity, human equality. The other side of the biblical revelation is that human beings are depraved. That depravity of human heart was as much at the heart of the Reformation. Uh, in Luther, he described this as the bondage of the will which is the struggle of Paul mentions in Romans 7, that the good things I want to do, I don't do. Bad things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing them repeatedly. 
uh, uh, what a miserable sinner I am and needing grace for salvation. So that bondage of the will which led to Luther and Erasmus first open controversy, uh, Erasmus uh, challenged Luther and then Luther challenged back and that controversy never got resolved in Europe because the, uh, Erasmus's final attack on Luther on this question of bondage of the will, uh, which is really the fallenness of the human will, uh, which in, um, uh, in uh, John Calvin became total depravity. What, was, what Luther called bondage of the will was total depravity. Uh, it, it is seeking deliverance from the dep depravity of my heart. Uh, it compels me to seek God's grace. L husbands, love your wives. This is not a moral value because uh, it is so much easier to love your neighbor's wife. You know, your neighbor's wife never asks you to pick up the dog poo or uh, change the baby's diaper or uh, mop the floor. Uh, your neighbor's wife makes good cakes and cookies, brings them to office, and you can talk to her about uh, politics and stock market. Maybe in your imagination, EU or she whatever. Does that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, loving your neighbor's wife is so much easier than loving your wife, but a husband's love your wife is not my value, it's a command which I have to obey. And obeying God's command is good for me because then uh, as I love my wife, she loves me and the children love and honor and respect me. And that's what builds the family and builds the community. So uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of human values, the, these are first of all not human values, they are biblical values um, and they uh, come as commands uh, that you shall not covet, you shall create, you shall work six days a week and create the wealth that you desire, uh, the good vineyard that you want, good house that you want. So work ethic is not a human value. This is a command uh, which we obey. So um, to, to take one side of the truth of uh, human dignity and human equality, and uh, forget the other side of the tr truth of human depravity, bondage of the will, that you are a slave to sin. Uh, you need the Savior to set you free. So uh, the, the reformation of Europe begins in, the, in, in a soul that is seeking salvation, seeking deliverance from sin. It's, it's not just a worldview battle. Yeah, worldview is important. Is human being really sinner? Is there an objective moral law which I have broken, for which I will be held accountable? Uh, these are important issues, and I have to come to terms with the sinfulness of my heart and seeking deliverance from that sin, and that's what drives one to the Savior. Yeah. So how do you do that? So let, let's let's think back to our friends and, and they, they might be high profile type people like a, a Tom Holland or a, or a Jordan Peterson. Uh, they might be our neighbor um, down the road. But what's different between our culture and 500 years ago is that um, all of Western Europe was convinced that there was a God to whom we were obligated, who would call us to account that there was some kind of a sin problem, and obviously there's a, there's a massive disagreement between Erasmus and Luther about how deep that sin problem goes and how desperate our plight really is. But there was at least an acknowledgement that there is a sin problem, that there is a God from whom to seek some kind of grace. Nowadays, the problem is structures. You know, in, in the modern imagination, the problem is sort of structures and institutions that I need to, to have deliverance from, and I need to turn to myself in order to be free. And, and we've, sort of, we've sort of flipped this idea on its head such that salvation in, in our modern sense and freedom in our modern sense is actually a freedom to indulge that which my heart desires. So how do you actually preach to a modern person 
a true sense of freedom and a, and a true sense of, of, of where human flourishing can be found? Well, th this is actually a theological problem which Western Christianity has imposed upon itself, upon the Western mind and upon the world. Jesus, God called Abraham, you follow me and I will take your soul to heaven. That was not what God said to Abraham. God said, you follow me, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation because through you, I want to bless all the nations. I want to bless England and I want to bless India. Uh, and I want to bless Yemen and Vietnam. So G God looks at uh, Abraham as a potential nation, which will needs to become a great nation. Uh, and... Uh, th that is what the father says to his son in Psalm 2, for example. Ask of me and I will make nations your inheritance, ends of the earth your possession. What the American gospel has done is interpreted that uh, to say, ask of me and I'll give you tons of souls. You will organize a great crusade in London uh, and I'll give you tons of souls. So this is American individualism that has been imposed upon the Bible. The Bible's own worldview is, ask of me and I will give you nations, ends of the earth as your possession. So that's why Jesus says that, yes, Satan is saying that these kingdoms of this world are mine. Uh, but in fact, all these kingdoms of the world have been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me because I surrendered myself to the Father. I became obedient to the point of giving up my life. So all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Therefore, you go into all the world and disciple nations. So the missiology in America, having surrendered to American individualism, a uh, secularized version of individualism, has seen... Uh, th this came to a climax in 1910 in Edinburgh. Edinburgh was a consultation on uh, world evangelism, of which so people like William Carey had come 100 years earlier and begun to create what has become modern India. Uh, but in 1910, uh, the influence of D.L. Moody, the, the uh, individualization of American Christianity, uh, showed itself when the Protestant mission split between simple gospel and social gospel. So the simple gospel became interested in taking souls to heaven. So salvation began to mean that, yes, I'm a sinner. I turn, accept Jesus as my savior. My sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven. But the social gospel for a while continued the whole Protestant tradition, which was there also during the Catholic Church. The Protestantism just took the best of the Catholic Church and uh, gave it to everyone. But uh, the, the dramatic change did come when Protestant nations became greatest nations in Europe, uh, in, which included England and Scotland. The Protestant nations became greater, stronger than the Roman Catholic and Orthodox nations uh, because the, the truth of God's word was applied to whole nations. And, but that was rejected following 1910 and uh, the evangelical Christianity uh, and liberal Christianity, as the simple gospel and social gospel were called, both corrupted the gospel. The social gospel surrendered to secular humanism to a point that there was no gospel left. Uh, Jesus was no longer savior from the sin. He was only interested in what the book culture is interested in now, uh, social justice issues. So the social gospel gave up the gospel that uh, we were sinners. God came into this world to save us from our sin. But the, or, the simple gospel movement gave up the original understanding of sin, that when Israel sins, it goes into slavery. When it repents from its sin, it gets political freedom, it gets shalom, it gets prosperity and peace. Uh, 
So the simple gospel evangelism uh, corrupted the gospel as much as the liberal gospel has corrupted. And therefore, uh, Christianity became irrelevant, uh, as one of the most famous Englishmen, uh, Oz Guinness, says, that Christianity became privately engaging, publicly irrelevant. And th that's the problem that um, uh, someone like um, your bishop, right, N.T. Wright, is, is trying to bridge of seeing the public dimension of the gospel. And this is what uh, Tom Holland is pointing out in Dominion, the public dimension of the gospel, which it is the evangelist, the American-inspired evangelist. Th th this problem was articulated by D.L. Moody, uh, who described his mission as, he said, the, the ship is sinking. Right. I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God has said to be moody, save all you can. That's, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always dunking on that quote. <laughs> okay, he, he said, I have a small uh, lifeboat. Uh, I can't save the ship, but I can save some drowning individuals, whoever gets into my boat. Th that became the motto for Billy Graham evangelism, and that began to define uh, defined the uh, private individualized salvation. Now, Osgenis is too much of a gentleman to uh, take these names and to say that this uh, privatized Christianity, which is publicly irrelevant, uh, and the appeal of the vogue culture and appeal of the secular humanists came because they kept this b biblical vision of nations uh, before them. And, uh, but of course, cut, the nation itself has been cut off from the Bible. So EU uh, doesn't know uh, whether EU should become a nation or EU should become a new European empire or whether the uh, concept of national sovereignty should continue. Uh, so the, there is intellectual confusion and there is no clear voice uh, in Europe a clear Christian voice on this issue because uh, biblical theology is about substitutionary death on the cross. It is not about God seeking to bless nations, turn those nations into great nations. But this is where the evangelical movement, this individualized, privatized evangelical movement, uh, it moves itself away from the public square and leaves it open for uh, the woke culture, where people who are taking some of the biblical ideas, such as justice and equality and dignity, uh, they be remain the only public voice because the church is silent on those issues. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And, and going back to the, the Bruce Glover um, uh, idea that you said before, you know, the Bible has given us, f you know, four religions in, in terms of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and then perhaps this sort of modern liberal secularism. secularism. And then perhaps what you've just described as woke culture might be a fifth religion. But it's, it's interesting that, those, that the fourth and the fifth, if the fifth really is a fifth religion, um, th they are arguing over that same individual versus social reality issue that we, we've got. So, you know, you've, you've got the sort of the, the, secular, the secular, modern, individualistic, sort of Western Lockean kind of uh, political liberalism, which, which boils things down to the individual. And then you've got the social justice, you know, idea of, you know, what, what you've described as, as woke culture. And, and how do you actually integrate the, the individual and the society together? You've got to go back to the original. You've got, you've got to go back to Christ, and, and you've got to, got to go back to the God of the Bible who can integrate the one and the many, the, 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 the particular and the individual and, and the society. And, of course, you know, a, a God who is one and three can, can do that, and, and a scripture who you, you know, who's preaching a Christ who unites the one and the many um, sort of gives you that. But, but it's interesting that in both church and world, world, we see the same difficulty of, of uniting the, the individual and the society. Yes. So in my understanding, 
Uh, one of the greatest contribution uh, 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 to the West that the Protestant Reformation brought was the discovery of the individual. So uh, Augustine already in his Confessions is dealing as a literary piece on individual consciousness, but it is when Luther takes a stand, when he says that here I stand, I shall not recant, I cannot recant, unless you persuade me from scriptures and plain reason that I'm wrong, because I cannot submit to the popes and bishops and councils, because far too often they have been wrong. My conscience is captive to the word of God. So that's the birth of modern individualism. Not that individualism wasn't present before that, but uh, it, it, that individual conscience must be respected uh, and Luther's sermon on two kingdoms that he gave in Marburg in 1528, uh, that was what John Locke quotes and that's what George Me uh, James Madison quotes when he introduces the Bill of Rights in American uh, Constitution, uh, in, uh, Senate, co Congress, that uh, the it is best articulated in 140 years after Luther in England, in Westminster Confession, where the chapter 20 of Westminster Confession is a chapter on conscience. Conscience is not an organ. You can do any amount of ultrasound and x-ray and open heart surgery. You will never find a gland or an organ called conscience. Conscience is part of God's image and who we are, what a human soul is. It's a spiritual concept. It's aspect of biblical metaphysics of man being made in God's image. So, um, uh, but Luther says th that uh, the, if God's kingdom has come, my soul has embraced God's word, the seed of God's kingdom, then uh, Kings and emperors and bishops and popes don't rule over my heart. God's word, God's seed rules because I have received his word and his word is now ruling my heart. The popes and emperors and uh, bishops have certain authority over me, uh, but, uh, but my heart belongs to Christ. He is my Lord. He rules. So that's where individualism was born, and it created uh, the strength of Western civilization. So individualism was actually an important source of the strength of Western civilization, of people taking responsibility for their own life, to walk with God, walk before God. But in 1841, this, this is... 300 years after Luther, this biblical idea of individualism begins to get secularized. Uh, uh, James, uh, Waldo Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, he was a young thinker. His wife died when he, she was just 19, died of tuberculosis. It shook him up and he gave a lecture and later, when he was recovering, he became very incisive thinkers as he saw his wife dying. And he gave a lecture called Self-Reliance. I think the lecture was given in the Masonic Lodge and published in one of his books. That lecture on self-reliance uh, turned biblical individualism into modern individualism, secularized individualism. So the biblical individualism was a radical commitment of an individual such as Jesus to say not my will but thine be done. Here's my body, here's my blood, take my body, take my blood, shed it, break it to satisfy and save others. So I surrender myself to God to be given to the world for the salvation of the world. This was biblical individualism, uh, which Paul understood that I'm dead to the world, the world is dead to me. I do not follow the world, I follow Christ. This is what Luther is saying, the biblical individualism. But the secularized version of individualism is putting me as an individual in the center of my universe. 
that this marriage is for me. If it doesn't satisfy me, it doesn't meet my interest, I divorce my wife. This pregnancy is for me. If this baby is too inconvenient, I kill the baby because my world revolves around me. I'm the center of my universe. I'm not surrendering myself that take my body, take my blood and bless the world, bless this baby, a pre-born or newly born baby. So secularization of individuals So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, secularization of individual uh, has uh, created uh, th th this modern uh, secular culture, which is so individualistic that it is destroying the family, it is destroying community, it is destroying nation. So here is a specific illustration of a secularized Christianity becoming a corruption and a curse. But th that is not to throw the baby with the bathwater. The Jesus does come to save individual, to save me from Satan's kingdom, save me from my own sinful heart, and to baptize me with God's spirit and make me part of God's kingdom, that I become a tree of life, a bearing fruit, uh, to bless others. The tree doesn't bear fruit for itself. Uh, the fruit is for the others. And that's the transformation. So uh, to, to relate it to what we were talking a few minutes ago, um, if you do not disciple the nation, which is what the evangelical movement has chosen for a hundred years not to do, not to disciple nations, but save individuals, you actually make it harder to save your own children. A church that does not disciple nation becomes incapable of saving its own children. Uh, and that's what has happened to Protestant nations. So, uh, the, that, uh, and key here is, of course, abandoning education the, the church, Protestant movement educated every child, every village, every town in England had a parish, uh, a church parish, parish school, where the priest was in charge of education. But after Napoleon, after the uh, European Enlightenment, the uh, church handed over education to the state. State is not an institution baptized with the spirit of truth. Intellectuals, professors, politicians, judges are so learned that don't even know the difference between a male and a female. They don't know what is love, what is marriage, what is sex, what is divorce, what is adultery, uh, what is a nation, what is justice, what, whether nations should have borders or EU should dissolve all the national borders. So you have... Um, Without the word of God, these ideas of nation, ideas of family, idea of marriage, sacredness of sex, all of these ideas came from the Bible. If you are not discipling nations, you're focused uh, following American evangelicals, you're focused on saving individual souls, you are not able to save your own children's souls. So this is what is happening to the evangelical church in America today, uh, that uh, you t t send them to Christian schools, take them to church. They grow up in Sunday school. By the time they go to college, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% of them quit church. The church is not able to save its own children because it has handed over the university to the devil. The university has become the source of darkness. And uh, the darkness that is flowing from Western universities uh, cannot be countered by evangelistic sermons. It cannot be countered by high school's education. We have to take on the power of Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and MIT and Stanford uh, because these universities have become the source of darkness for the West and the world. Mm. That's a serious word, Vishal. But should we should we end on, on a note of hope? Um, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you very much. I, I just wonder, what is it that gives you hope? 
in the midst of all, all the serious words that you've given us? What gives you hope? Well, the, the simple fact that the world knows that it is lost. When a Supreme Court judge who is a woman uh, cannot define what a woman is, they know how lost and how dark they are. Uh, in the midst of this, the church in the West, including in England, still has the capacity to disciple nation. It no longer has the theology of discipling nations. It accepts that, yes, education belongs to the state as a responsibility of the state, even though both Oxford and Cambridge started as Augustinian monasteries. Yes, Christian monasteries, Christianity educated the whole nation, uh, but the theology has changed. Uh, being a light to the nation is no longer our responsibility. So theology has corrupted, it has become corrupt, but the church in Europe and church in America still has the capacity to disciple nations, and that's what the third education revolution is all about. So if you go to www.thirdeducationrevolution.com, uh, you will see the proposal of how uh, the church can take education back from the devil. The state education has become devilish. The church can take education back from the devil and disciple the nations, disciple the mind. Uh, that's what gives me hope. If the European church and American church refuses to obey the Lord to disciple the nations, well, he is capable of raising African church and Asian church and Indian and Chinese church uh, to uh, teach a lesson or two to the Western church. So uh, the, the stump of Jesse will bring forth a new branch, and this servant of the Lord will be baptized with spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. This is uh, the end times prophecy, that the earth will be covered with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. A profoundly hopeful vision, uh, Vishal, and, and stemming straight from the Bible, our, our favorite book, the book that built our world, but that uh, continues to breathe life into the people of God that we might uh, overflow with good news for the world. Uh, Vishal, uh, that's the best way of getting in touch with you, is it, to go to third re uh, thirdeducationrevolution.com? Uh, yes, my own website is revelationmovement.com revelationmovement.com but thirdeducationrevolution.com also would come to me awesome well so let's stick to thirdeducationrevolution.com oh, we've not been maintaining that website but we will do that now so <laughs> let's begin with the thirdeducationrevolution.com this can be your 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 prompt there will be a flood of uh of people coming your way, although I, I can't promise the same numbers as after you did Jordan Peterson. They, you, you sold out Amazon after, after you were on his show, is that right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, and, uh, but the book is back uh, in print. Uh, and it's also being translated. Yeah, yeah. Well, a fascinating book. It's uh, it's well worth everybody's time, and I, I heartily recommend it. But uh, Vishal, thank you so much for joining us on the way back. Well, thank you for having me, and God bless England. I'm looking forward to being in London at the end of October. I'd love to, love to catch up with you then. Okay, thank you, Vishal. Sure.